So welcome everyone. Um, so today I will talk about Node to the Rescue and let Node do stuff that you probably don't want to do in WordPress. So a little bit about myself. I founded my own company, Code Kitchen. I'm the lead developer of Globpress. Um, I contributed back to WordPress since 3.0. Uh, I build plugins, I'm one of the organizers of work in Belgrade, and I like to play with new technology. So, why something else than WordPress? Um, you can build basically almost everything in WordPress, but the question is, is that the smart thing to do? Like, do you want to build stuff in WordPress if WordPress, or in this case, generally PHP, is built for? And in the end, can you trust WordPress to always, always be stable? So in 4.2, we had one or two automatic updates or minor updates that broke stuff. Little stuff, but still they broke stuff. And if you build a system with a million viewers a day, a month, breaking is not good. And this summer, I also started to move my things away from WordPress and especially from like a new server environment. So the reason was because of WP Central. Um, and WP Central is a little project I built to uh, show download history, some WordPress statistics, statistics, like what is the PHP version currently, what is the most used one, and what was the history since a year. So you can see the drop of PHP 5.2, 5.3, the same for WordPress, the same for MySQL. And with that, you can s make like some kind of analysis of what you want to do. Like you see where WordPress is heading, like can we already expect a certain drop off that you as a plugin developer don't have to use PHP 5.2 anymore, but you can use if you want namespace of what is available in 5.3. Um, I also collect some local st statistics. Uh, I build up a whole list of like the percentage what was done, what is now currently on WordPress.org. So I started on WP Central and then they moved away and they implemented it on WordPress.org and currently I need to fix it again. Um, and I also now getting checksums what you can normally already get from core, but also for plugins and for plugins and teams. And that's the reason why I moved away to Node.js, because that's something you could do in WordPress, but it's not a smart thing to do because you don't want to block the current view of the user. Um, so currently how it works is I use a lot of WP remote gets. I create websites to just read the HTML to see what kind of information is there, like the picture, where you're from, from all that kind of information, also from contributors, from locales, like the API of WordPress to read stuff that I know a bit more about WordPress, but also for contributors that work for WordPress. And everything can be combined, and I will present that. And, but the problem is, is that a lot of things happen by WP Cron. And that hap when that one gets run, it runs by the user. So a user will see a block for like a few seconds, but it can be more than 10 seconds depending on what is currently going on. So I already disabled the, the WordPress cron by running my own, but still it's, that's not what you should do. Like you lie, a pr you fix a problem, but not really the problem, but like an effect of the problem instead of fixing the real problem. And yeah, resulting is that it could lead to a lot of lo lo loading of pages. So in this summer I moved away from my current VPS to DigitalOcean, and I changed my infrastructure. So if you look at it, you see suddenly I don't have one v machine running, but I have multiple. Like I have my load balancer, I have Tumblr for re regenerating images. So you can send an image and it will resize like something like uh, Photon with uh, Jetpack does. Uh, I run multiple web servers. I have like my machine with my database, and I have one now called microservices. So the service server, with I have included the database, but also Memcache, soon Elasticsearch. Normally you should do split it in multiple machines, but for now it's fine to have it in one, because my site is not really that high traffic, but I do complicated things. I already run PHP 7. I like to play around with new technology. And then we have the microservice service. So it handles some of the, like all the, I, because I disabled the cron job of WordPress, now I need to call it myself. But because it's a network installation, it means I need to call the cron per side on the network. So I wrote a little script to do that, and I started making a Node.js service that does it f some stuff for me. So currently it's generating only the checksums of plugins and teams, 
but soon it will also get like the download code of WordPress that I store every minute. Why would WordPress do it if I can create a little service that runs it every minute for me? And soon I will merge more, more and more. And then the question is, what are microservices? So a microservice by definition is something really small and it should do it, the, the task itself. And it should be really focusing on that task only. So instead of like having WordPress that have like 10,000 files, basically one million lines of code, you only have like one file, maybe 200 lines, depending on the problem. Some problems are a little bit trickier to fix, but you have something small, like if you want to make a change there, you can do that without like one line in one million lines that has so much effect that you don't know what happens. Um, and the benefits are that you have different services in different programming languages. So one programming language is really good for writing data, but the other one is more for reading data, is more for parsing the data, like building graphs. Like so in my case, I prefer Node.js. Um, you have a high level of a separation because of that. Like if you break one thing somewhere else, that it doesn't break the whole website. It just breaks downloading the WordPress account. Like I can live with one hour no stats. I can live with that. Living without uh, all my sites down for an hour, less. Um, and if, especially there, where like if WordPress breaks, even the service is still running. Like if WordPress breaks, I still get my accounts. People can still request um, some data if it, I pass through that instead of WordPress. Um, it's ease of deployment, so it's not easy as in deployment, but it's really easy because if you want to change one line, you can do it really easy without breaking. Like if like we always say WordPress is really easy to update things, but we already seen with WordPress itself, things can break. Like how good you are as a developer, things will break. Like if like most of the plugins on WordPress org don't have someone who does QA. They don't check it, like they check it themselves. Um, I see myself as someone who really cares about the code. I'm not saying really good coder, but I really care. But even I manage to like, if I send something to QA, that C will find five issues with it. And I spent hours trying that C would find none. And you can scale one particular serve if it takes more. Like for WordPress, like every release, a lot of zip files need to be packaged. For all the locales, for WordPress itself, that is basically a, a, a task that only happens once a month. So on that, one at that time in a month that you can just say, okay, create a new server, and let everything happen there, but after that, destroy the service again. So only you can create a new VPS with only doing that little task and then destroy it again. So instead of having that machine running a whole year for, say, six hours of work per year, probably more, why that's it's already cheaper, but it's so much easier because you don't really have to care about updates anymore because the machine only exists for a while. And when you create a new machine again, you can basically start from all the new stuff. And in generally, all the microservices have like a REST API. They can like be accessed by different ways, but in generally, you create like a JSON API you can call and it will give you some information back. Uh, it's really reusable because of that, because you can talk to the API. So if you have like a microservice like for, like if I release a plugin and I have a microservice for releasing my plugin from GitHub to WordPress.org, probably because I then also want to already re regenerate the checksum for my plugin. So when I get released to WordPress.org and I know it's there, I can make a call to the other microservice doing that for me. So instead of like having shared libraries or having everything tied together, it's still pretty tied together, but it's more bounded by the code itself. Like one thing can run PHP, but the other one can run Node, the other one can run Java. And because of that, you can work pretty autonomous, like small teams working on their little product. And I choose for Node for to play around because I'm a web developer. I know PHP. I know also JavaScript. So why should learn Python, Java, or any other programming language if I already work daily with JavaScript? So Node is a JavaScript platform. It uses an event-driven, non-blocking. Uh, EO mo uh, module. So it will run, if it will basically every action 
it doesn't have to wait for. If you request a URL, you have to use callbacks to get the result back. You can't say, like, I request some data from online, please parse in a template. It will break because the moment you call the template, that request is still hanging around waiting for data. Because asking for a template is one microsecond. Asking data can take up to five seconds, 10 seconds, depending where it is and how long that could take. Like, you don't know. It's unexpected behavior. Um, so it's ideal for real-time application because of that is really fast. There's a lot of modules you can use. So for JavaScript, you have NPM there, and you can go there. You can install all kinds of modules that will help you build your uh, application. And because of that, your code of your application is small. And why to use it for me is it's an in, it already has like a web server in it. Like with PHP, you need to tell with Haiti Access or to Nginx that how the URLs are being rewritten. In this case, you get a Node.js application that has already an IP with a port number. Depends how on how you do it. Like you can say also port 80, no problem. Like Ghost is also built on Node. And there you can say like, well, pass all the requests to the application and that will handle how it will be rewritten. So there's basically zero configuration on the server level. And that makes it really easy to, to deploy on all kinds of machines. You can deploy it on Windows, on a multi-server environment, no matter what the requ requirements are. As long as you can install the NPM modules, you can do what you want. And in the end, you basically have an application that is standalone and you know what you get. Um, this list I should have completed. Like A lot of people already using it. Like, who uses Netflix here? It's really popular. And it basically uses almost everything is Node.js. Like Solando is doing the same a little bit. Like they have multiple teams, like from PHP to Node, to do all these kind of things. Like it's still not really like I think in there still maybe it's already stable, but but it's a technology that is at least built on a daily base to make things better. And what I said, it already has like a lot of cool modules. Like you have Express or Restify for a web server, like where Express is more for like websites. Uh, Restify is more for APIs, so you can build a whole only solely API on that. And like Netflix uses that actively in their products. Uh, you have Socket EO. It's um, for like chat, like real time application. You can really use it for WordPress with your front end. Like you can, from the admin, you say, please play this YouTube movie now. And all the users will get that URL and it will be displayed on the place you want it to be displayed. Um, you have requests like WP, uh, HTTP, where you can just say like, here's a request, please give it to me. Um, you also have request JSON, where it has the same, but it's more built for micro, uh, if you are talking to the API, you say that's the URL and you, you can get only the pod. You have async for each, like if you want to have multiple calls, and when it when those are done, please load a template. Like that module is really easy and handy for to use it for things like that. Uh, MySQL is a bit more tricky because with PHP, when you load WordPress and it ends, the MySQL connection is closed. If you build a server, like Node is continuously running, so you need to kill the MySQL, MySQL connection yourself. Uh, if you don't, those will be hanging and at, within seconds nothing will be handled anymore because you forgot to close the connection, depending what you do. Like I like when using MySQL to use pools, so I know there's so many requests that can be handled so the, that the database is not getting killed by one microservice and the others can't access anymore. And you have Node CMD for command line access. Like if, for example, I'm now working on some code to parse all the SVN logs of WordPress to see how many uh, people have contributed to it, when they contributed to it, to so have like some graphs to see what is the percentage of existing uh, uh, contributors and which one are new in, in a certain release. And then getting the SVN log from command line is way more easier because you get like, and then you can parse it and the parse is also already a module written by someone. So now a little bit about the project why I started doing building microservices with Node. And that's basically creating checksums for plugins and teams. Like my site almost got hacked. I was lucky that my setup is a little bit 
different than a normal one, so the guy w couldn't do it with a default script, but they were able to give me PSP files or change probably stuff. And that's why I built little things like this that I can scan my w server to see if plugins or teams are changed. Obviously, this only works for WordPress.org, but it's already a really good start. So what it does is basically you say, I want to request a plugin like Jetpack, and I want to get the checksums of uh, version one zero. You request that. At that point, it will download the zip file and unzip it. From that point, it will read all the stuff in memory and parse it bit by bit, file by file. So it will get the checksums, and those checksums are stored in the database. And from there, you can, when you ask for it again, it will be retrieved from MySQL and given to the user. So Node already has some modules in it. So I used the file system module FS, and I used crypto for the MD5 hashes for the checksums. And I used some NPM modules like Express, MySQL, Request, and Yauzl for the unzipping. And that one can already do everything in memory. So even large files are parsed bit by bit so I don't have memory issues. And I built my own queue class because I can use somewhere, something else, but it was easier to build it there because it's for like 50, 70 lines of code. It's better to have something yourself that you know what happens wh when and where. And how I did it was a bit, I, would not, I think it's more on a professional level. So I have a WordPress JSON API, a RESTful API that you call. That's the public one. And from there, you call Nginx, and Nginx will then call the Node.js application. And the reason why I did that, if I break Node.js, and Nginx will at least give really fast a JSON response back to WordPress. So WordPress will not hang, but Nginx will deal why the Node application was crashed, and Node application will probably restart it again. But in that time, there's no big delay for the user. And how the API calls are structured are in a way like you say plugin or team, you give the slug, you give the version. Um, the same goes for plugin and team are exactly the same, except they have different ones because it's then more obviously what happens where. And for, you never know what WordPress will change. And Nginx is pretty easy in there. You can give custom error handlers. So for um, the 404, you already see. I give an, an I add a header, say it's a JSON response, and I already have a, my own written JSON gift back. So it will then give like a normal Node.js application, what we'll see like it will throw 404 with a status like the route is not found. And if the Node application is crashed, it will say the service is down. Um, and you can even do more stuff. Like if you have different error codes, you can add that. Really easy to do. So now a little bit over the code. Um, so the MySQL, uh, the, the MySQL connection and all the other things are, you have to load this st stuff in. So you use require. And for the server, you need to use then, say this variable app is express, so please start it up. And from there, you build up the MySQL connection, say I have a, a pool of 10. And this is the IP, this is the user, the password, the things that you expect with WordPress 2 with wp-config. And for example, if you forgot to close a my MySQL connection is really handy to have the last line. So it basically says like, well, I'm still waiting for a new connection. Like everything is full. And when you forgot to close a connection, you know when it happens because you can see it in your logs on your command line. And listening to an IP is pretty easy to do with servers. Like this one is the basic request what I have. So it will say, please listen to port 4000 and if you got a request with slash plugin with a variable slug and variable version, please run this code. So I will see if it's in a queue. If, in, if it's already in a queue, it will return back. Oh, I'm already generating the checksums. Uh, please wait a while. Uh, and generally, it only takes like probably less than a second, but not more than, than that. So and generally, people will not see it, but it's still good to have it there. And also here, you can say like before, I was using like get, but you, when, when you use app use, you can do a lot of more cool stuff. You can give classes with multiple get that you have like more um, an MVC framework. And in this case, I will just say like every request that you can't find, please return this JSON. So you say success is false and the error is the route doesn't exist. 
So let's check a little bit of the rest of the code that it's a bit easier to show it here. So again, you s uh, I should not have used that. Uh, so again, you see the same code back again. Um, you see I start a new queue that at least that's still in a public and not on a per request level. Um, the plugin in Teams is the same. I tried to make a freeze loop, but the problem is then um, the application get confused that it thinks there's only one instead of two. Uh, so here it's the queue itself. Um, you have to do for self is this because a lot of how Node works is with a lot of callbacks. In that callback, this is not that object anymore. It's something else. So it's really good to store it in a self or a different variable that you can request it from there. So I check if, if you add it. I will check if it ex exists or not. Um, if it exists, please return false. Um, and if it's uh, there, not there, if the collector is having all the magic in there. So it will, if the, if it's not running yet, it will start running and it will already execute the code for you that it will parse all the things. Uh, it's nothing more complex. It will have some error logging, like it will show me when it's running. So I, if, when there is a mistake, I can see it in the logs that what was going on. And basically this the collector what does all the magic. So what you see there is like, I have a pool with co connections, so I will ask, please give me a connection. Um, you will already prepare your S uh, statement for the database. Um, you can have the insert that it's like a prepared statement. Uh, then you format it that it's right, then you can pass it to the connection, please um, execute this database query. And with like the select statement to see uh, when everything is there. Like if it's already in a database, it can already return back the data. So then we, you get an, an object with all the files and all the checksums that you can be, uh, give back to the user. So um, like for example, if you have like a WP slide command, it can parse the JSON and do stuff with it. Um, and if something ha happens, like you can say like, okay, um, Apparently, uh, when I was asking here for the data, uh, I didn't have it. So, uh, so please release the connection and return back. Oh yeah, I'm I'm now starting generating it, or I'm going to generate it. And if the database could not get a connection f uh, from the pool, it will say like the database is down. And especially the downloading of the zip is pretty uh, pretty cool stuff. Like you can again, I will always have separated ways of getting the database connection and releasing it again. Probably it could be better, but I like it this way because every function has its own goal, and it will ask for a connection if it's needed or not. It's in generally those connections will be open in the background anyway. Uh, and what I do here is like I build up an array with the information that I need to pass to WordPress. I will build up an URL uh, that has all the information, but before that I will say like, oh, insert in the database that this plugin with this version or this team with this version is already asked for to generate the checksum. So even if the server crashes, it can use that data to restart the whole process again. And then I will ask on WordPress.org the, the file, the zip file. It will store it temporarily locally, but it will parse it then. Um, it will parse the data in memory. And that way it's really fast, but also only the bits of data will be loaded in memory that are needed at that point. Um, so when you go to then the read zip, you will see on every entry, I will start doing that. And on every time you get a data, I will collect that data. I will update the hash. So the problem is you can't get all the data from a file. If it's some one million lines of code, you can't do that. So you need to go 100 lines or 500 lines by, by, per time. And every time ask the MD5 hash. And every time update the hash when you get more data. 
and when you're done, I will store everything in an array. So afterwards, when every, all the files are there, I can then store it. So my database is, dot, is not, not, not getting corrupted by data that doesn't exist or is only for the half there. Now I know exactly when something goes wrong, I can look in the database like what went wrong. I see there are no files there or I see all the files there. So if all the files are there with all the checksums, I know something else went wrong somewhere else. I don't know, I don't, I, the state, what happened is more clear than if you would store it per file, per checksum, because then you get like 45% is done, not zero or 100. And in the end, I will store all the checksums uh, by storing it per time. So still, something can go wrong here, but it's only for the database. I could have built up a whole long insert query, but the problem is if you have 1,000 files, this query can be too long or can break stuff. And with 290 lines of code, with obviously external modules, I already built something that is really useful for people who care about security. Because now I have an API that I can build a WP Sly command on and run it locally to see what are my files changed. And when you have like a CLI command, suddenly for you it also makes it easier when you have a thousand sites stored on your server. Or if you are a shared host, for example, that, that does want to do stuff like that. So now you can run this by your internal system that already have that, instead of going to the database or to the file system and guess it yourself if it's WordPress or not. Uh, and then you need to start the server. So Node by itself, if it crashed, it crashed completely. It doesn't reboot out of, out of itself, but it's really easy to test. So the default way is Node and the file your code is in. But if you go to production, you have multiple ways. Like you have forever, but I choose now PM2, what it has more features and you can do really cool stuff with it. And in this case, I will start a new server with the file with a different user than I would do normally because normally I would have probably run in root. And I can say what the name is. And uh, I don't have the code here, but you can also say like, which are the services running now? You, all the log files are there. So if something goes wrong, it will still store on the log file when your server got crashed, what was expected. Um, there's a lot of cool features out there that makes it easier to do deployments. Um, PM2 already have that in, in place too. So if you want to de deploy new code, it can do that too without basically zero uh, downtime. Obviously there's always that 0.1% case that something goes wrong or your code is broken, modules are not there, but at least it's really easy to do the deployments by the help of tools like PM2. So the new situation is that I don't have any weird logic in WordPress anymore. WordPress does one thing. It generates the website with the data I provide. Still, the microservice can throw it in a database and generally it should return it as an API. But if you like to do it more unprofessional, you can even, that microservice stores in a database and WordPress gets it from the same database. Um, again, we. We are not do, uh, always there to do professional. Sometimes if it's easy to do, why not? Why build all kinds of APIs that you need to request or it hated to be anyway then too? Um, it all depends what you do. Um, and the, the benefit now is that I have a really small services. So for example, I like I, what I now do with WP Central is really experimenting with all kinds of ways to download stuff. When I did something to weird or exotic, then at least that li microservice breaks. Like again, if I download the WordPress account, like for say, for three is now downloaded two million times and I will lose for one hour, I don't care. Even if I lose that data for a day, I can still ask probably if I, if I need to recover it, probably if I ask the core team, they will provide and otherwise, well, I don't mind that much, but if my, also my company is running there, my own blogs are running there, some other stuff is running there. If that is down for 
10 minutes, maybe someone complains. If it's down for a day, I'm pretty sure someone will complain that something is wrong. And that makes it, now it's so separated that I can do whatever I want. I can push updates. It's so much easier. Um, currently, there's no caching enabled there, but I have suddenly, for the checksums, multiple locations where I can store. WordPress can store. Nginx can store. And I can store it through Node.js. And it can be memcache. It can be file. I have a lot of options suddenly where I can cache it that it what makes the most sense. So probably on the web server where your site is hosted, probably storing it in, say, memcache doesn't make sense. But maybe it does. It all depends what the code does. Like in my case for this, Probably no caching is the best or the easiest way to do because it's not time it's not time bounded. So if you use WP Sly, well, WP Sly command will be a little bit slower. I I think probably everyone can live with that. Um, but to add caching logic there, like if say it becomes popular and suddenly, like from twenty thousand plugins, multiple versions for the I think now 5,000 teams, what is on that arc, multiple versions, that, and that will be requested on daily uh, day, then that's a lot of data that you need to cover, need to be returned, and somewhere stored in a database. What will pro or, or in memcache, like in memory, like it's impossible. So database is probably the only location you could do it. And uh, internal HTTP requests are generally pretty cheap then. Uh, we're almost on the end, and then, well, I showed you one example, but what are the other things you can do with Node.js? So when I started with doing stuff with Node.js, I was starting with Socket.io. And what I was trying to do is, uh, who knows WordSash? So I was trying to help Scott out with building that. Like, well, why people refreshing the whole time if the new YouTube movie is there? And accidentally load the old the move from an hour ago and they watching that and suddenly it's like, why are people chatting about um, Node instead of what I'm now reading about SEO? This way I can push a new, a new YouTube movie literally to a thousand people if I want to because Node allows me that, it's really fast, it's not PHP that needs to be parsed. Um, people say WordPress is fast but it isn't. It's not always to blame on WordPress, it's partly to blame on PHP. It's also partly to blame on host. There's so many things out there that can go wrong. And even in this case, if the node server will crash, people can start refreshing the page again. Um, so there's not a lot of problems. But it was a really cool experiment to see how can you solve something that you or someone else have problems with and do it on a way that you normally don't. Um, I was also thinking about other things, like I love the way to like schedule a task, like say, I want this URL to be called or this task to be done like 10 or 20 minutes from now. Uh, build like a central caching point for like external source, like say you have a network installation of WordPress, but on 10 of them, you show your, your tweets. Instead of 10 websites calling Twitter and 10 places where your API keys is there and suddenly you have only one place, so if Twitter changes their API, one place to fix. If your API keys got stolen and you need to regenerate, one place to fix. Uh, suddenly, nine of the 10 sites are fast, uh, basically suddenly in 10 sites are faster because the data is loaded in the background on the node servers. Instead of WordPress doing that on you unlucky visitor that at one point you visited, that suddenly that page will start asking for tweets. And if you want to do it really fast, say you can build a whole web server asking for your tweets every minute. And you get, or you're still in the limit of the, the limit Twitter gives you. Um, you can do real-time support. Uh, you can do get to SVN uh, sync. Like I would be interesting to do, like if I commit something to GitHub, that GitHub will call the service and then it will see if it needs to deploy something on WordPress. And when a new version is there, already generate the checksums, generate some language files or stuff that needs to be there. Uh, one thing I'm now playing with is to build a backup service for my hosting environment. Like, for me, it doesn't make sense to make a backup somewhere online, especially if that script is running on my web service, because then if a hacker gets in, it knows exactly where my backup is and can probably break the backup. 
So why not having it running locally on a computer at my home? I only needed one backup a day, and pretty sure my laptop is on then. Um, for example, real-time logging. Like if your site pushes something to your log file, you can also push it directly to a Socket.io connection that pushes it through Slack or whatever channels that you will use on a daily basis. So you can see if something critical happens. Like if you see a fatal error, you know that a fatal error happened. Like I have it still sometimes that I tweak a little bit with WordPress, like a custom database handle that suddenly in some cases generates a fatal error or some notices that I don't want to see. So at that point, I can push it to Slack or to some kind of application I custom built to see it. Or you perform some other really heavy tasks like zipping files and zipping. So for WordPress, the zipping of all the lo uh, local zip files for every download or now build a whole node application because they are now moving all the plugins to translate the WordPress to R. So on every commit in SVN, something needs to be happening again. How cool would it be to have like an API? Like if, uh, say someone complains like me, like why, why are my um, language files out of date in, on, WordPress, on translate the WordPress or The guy says, I don't know, something happened, but I can request it already. Because the guy can already go to like and build up the URL, internally ask for it, and at that point it gets regenerated. Why trust best scripts, like local scripts running around somewhere on someone's machine? That's how WordPress R currently works. They have scripts running on their sandbox, not even on production, doing stuff for production. That, to me, doesn't make sense. And by that, it's the end of my presentation. Um, does someone have any questions? Um, my question would be um, those checksums for themes and plugins you are yeah. calculating, uh, will they be available through a public API? Yeah. Yeah. So um, if I go back. So here you already see like. Uh, uh, check, um, so yeah, the top one is the public one. So if you go to wpcentral.io, then API, checksums, plugins, Tabify edit screen, and then a version, it does work. And what does it return? Only, like, is it a JSON with all the files and all the checksums for every file? Uh, it is an array with IDs in it. Um, so, wpcentral. So basically it's this. So it re returns an array with objects in it, with file and a checksum. So this way, if I want to extend it with multiple, like instead of like an MD5, I can also extend it with SAA or something else. Uh, I wanted to do first the WordPress way, but I think the WordPress way is indeed with like the file name and then the checksum, but it's then really hard to extend. You can mul make multiple services. It depends what you want, I, I think. Any more questions? Then thank you for listening. Thank you.